In this segment, we will consider the formation of our solar system, consisting of a wonderfully beautiful ensemble of planets to scale, dominated by Jupiter, and of course these other large gas giants, and we have our beautiful Earth and some of the smaller ones. Even Pluto's sitting out here. Well, there is a rich history and a fairly not well understood but involved and complicated process of the planets forming where they did through various physical processes that we're understanding better and better. So let's investigate some of these things. So in the beginning, there was the nothing. Actually, nobody knows what there truly was in the beginning. But in the next moment, what emerged onto the scene was the explosive but highly tuned expansion of matter, energy, space, and time in an event known as the Big Bang. And over the next billion years or so, the first stars came about and galaxies forming with the very earliest stars. And there were multiple generations of stars over the next billions of years that took place leading up to our current star in our solar system, the Sun. But in the course of time, since initially it was only hydrogen and helium, we have these stars burning or fusing the hydrogen and producing other elements, helium and then heavier elements. And after exhausting their fuel, a lot of these stars puff out their ashes in what's known as a planetary nebula, seeding the interstellar medium with heavier elements, things that we're made out of, like carbon. And even more significantly, after 10,000 years or so after these fade out and they keep coming and going, every now and then we have a supergiant star that shines with extraordinarily extraordinary brightness. And when it's done burning its fuel, in the process of which it concocts elements as heavy as iron, then it goes off in an incredible energetic explosive event known as a supernova. And it's so energetic that not only does it spew its innards that it produced in its life, but also produces elements heavier than iron, like silver, gold, platinum, and yes, yttrium. And the other super heavy elements. So this has an incredible influential effect on the interstellar medium, seeding the interstellar medium with gas and dust that have the heavier elements, which are known as metals, so that the next generation of stars that form have a different constituency. And that's really, really important. We'll dis discuss that more later. The supernova fades out after a few months, and but it's done its, its job of providing the raw materials to produce more interesting stars that come later with the heavy elements it needs to make things that are really interesting. Stars form in massive gas and dust clouds. This particular example is far more expansive than it would appear just looking at the picture, light years in extent. But after several generations of stars have spewed their ashes into the surrounding area, the interstellar medium, Finally, we have enough heavy elements that the generation at that point, which we're fast forwarding and getting right to our solar system, has the capacity, the inherent capacity, to produce planets in addition to just stars because there's enough gas and dust, the dust in particular, that's beyond hydrogen and helium to produce rocky planets like Earth. So that's really important. So we're well into the age of the galaxy and the conditions are just right for gravity, along with a little bit of help, to collapse this cloud and form stars. Now, clouds don't want to just collapse because they have internal pressure and there's magnetic and gravitational and other turbulent instabilities that tend to prevent it from collapsing. So it's a war between gravity and the things opposing gravity. So every now and then, gravity wins. And when it does, it's known as achieving what we call genes instability, and that's necessary to get the cloud to collapse and form stars. And then, 
here's a not a picture but a drawing of approximately what we would get this is supposedly our protostar the Sun and there's a huge disk around the Sun that's ultimately gonna produce the planets that we know and this is not without empirical evidence we can for instance look in the Orion Nebula which is shown here and well it's a stellar nursery and as we speak stars are being formed in the protosolar disks that they are in and so yes this is something that's going on right now and we can study some of their characteristics taking even a closer look at the same nebula the great nebula in Orion at the highest resolutions we actually see these dust disks around the, the proto stars here's our solar system the size of the solar system those dust disks are known as protoplanetary disks because they produce the planets if the conditions are right to produce planets so we can see planets being born essentially in real time and that's pretty useful to understand how our own solar system formed well our star the Sun formed by drawing over 99 percent of the gas and dust in the proto-solar nebula into itself to produce the star yet there was enough debris left over in the in the disk surrounding it to produce all the planets including Jupiter and the other giants as well as the inner planets so this is a process that is being understood with greater clarity there's a lot of gaps in our detailed understanding but let's investigate what we know about it to date and certainly what we see what we realize is our current solar system and the line of planets and it has this interesting characteristic where the four inner planets Mercury Venus Earth and Mars are terrestrial rocky bodies followed by four gas giants so that's the broadest perhaps categorization distinctions between the planets so why do we have the gas giants forming in the outer region and the terrestrial rocky planets forming in the inner regions and then we have the dwarf planets also which in particular Pluto is a member of we'll discuss that some more and uh, Ceres here is actually part of the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter so let's gain a little bit of understanding about what's going on here let's consider a particular model of the solar system the formation thereof that's gaining ground in the scientific community it's known as the nice model we begin with a huge rotating cloud of dust and gas out there as part of a small subset typically of the really massive molecular cloud that forms thousands of stars in a particular group so we're just looking at one in particular here and this cloud literally can be thousand astronomical units in extent keep in mind the astronomical unit is the average distance between the earth and the Sun 93 million miles so that's really pretty big containing about maybe two or three solar masses the cloud is very cold water would freeze and it consists of not just the hydrogen and helium but about one or two percent metals to an astronomer which are anything heavier than hydrogen and helium so it's a little bit more inclusive than what we in common everyday language consider metals so a protostar forms and that begins to grow and to shine well how does that happen well it turns out there's a lot of potential energy in the gas cloud and you can imagine if you pick up a chair and drop it onto the floor that the point of contact might gain temperature a little bit well maybe you don't know that but it actually does potential energy can be converted to kinetic energy which then can be converted to heat and even though I wouldn't recommend dropping things onto the floor to heat your house up it might increase your own metabolic rate and make you warm but the temperature in the house won't change very much but on the scale of a star and the formation of a star 
this process really is effective at producing heat. You know, you can imagine if you just rub your hands together and the friction, the heat produced by the fr friction is maybe a better example that's more intuitive to you, how you can get a lot of heat from different forms of energy. And it literally, this, this protostar actually shines by the light produced by that energy conversion. So it's by gravitational collapse rather than by fusion, which it will be when it matures a little bit. And also, uh, if you think about an ice skater spinning around, a figure skater, bringing her arms and legs in to spin up even faster, well, that's what's going on with this nebula. As the nebula collapses in, it spins up faster. And that spin up actually has a tendency to limit how much of the material that's now forming into a disk can actually be drawn in. Because if you spin something up really fast, as you may know, it tends to fly apart. So when those forces are in balance, you're done collapsing the main disk. To understand the subsequent discussion of how the solar system forms, it's really important to understand, well, what's the debris disk made out of? What are its constituents? Well, we can categorize that. There's four basic types as shown here. We have the hydrogen helium gas, hydrogen compounds, we have rock, and we have metal. And at this point, when we say metal, we're talking about our regular understanding of metal. So we're talking about things like iron, nickel, aluminum, so metallic, heavy elements. What's important to understand is they have different condensation temperatures. And in addition to that, they have significantly different relative abundances. So let me kind of go in reverse order here. I think it's the easiest to understand. So the metals, very small percentage, 0.2% of the material is this really heavy stuff. The square is indicative of the relative proportion of that. Rock, minerals, 0.4%. Uh, 0.2%, 0.4%. The hydrogen compounds, otherwise known as the volatiles, that have hydrogen in them, 1.4%. And the vast majority of the disk of material in the solar nebula and the, and the disk is hydrogen and helium. So 98%, this square represents almost all the mass of the protosolar disk. Well, what we need to understand is that these condensation temperatures vary widely. What does that mean? Well, metals, okay, they don't vaporize very easily. So we're talking about 1,000 to 1,600 Kelvin before they vaporize. Well, another way to think about that is they condense when they get that cool, kind of like, you know, the droplets of water that form on your, on your glass of ice water in the warm summer, that is water vapor condensing out and forming liquid on the surface of your glass. Well, in the same way, when it's cool enough, namely this hot, but nevertheless at this cool a temperature, the metal will precipitate out and become metallic like we think of instead of just a vapor in vapor form. So the metal can exist in very hot conditions. In like manner, rocky materials, 500 to 1300 Kelvin, they vaporize. So they, can, they can't be as close to the sun as this material can or it will vaporize. It won't condense out. The volatiles, these hydrogen containing compounds, they don't exist at very warm temperatures. So at about 150 K, 150 Kelvin, which is actually quite cold, they will vaporize. And so when it's cooler than that, they can exist in that form. And then last but not least, of course, what about the hydrogen and helium? Well, it doesn't condense at all. In other words, it stays as hydrogen and helium gas. So no matter how close to the sun it is or how far away it is, it's still in gaseous form. So that is extremely key to understanding how the different planets form and where they form.